First off, let me just say that we at RFMS really appreciate the opportunity to be here and to showcase some of the improvements we've made to Measure over the past year. Hopefully some in attendance today work with Measure on a regular basis or have at least used it in the past. But for any who aren't familiar with it, I thought we might begin with a brief overview of how Measure handles a commercial takeoff. Now, I don't want to spoil any of the reveals we have to share with you later, so for this overview, I'm going to use the current public version of the software. The process of performing a commercial takeoff and measure can basically be broken down into five steps. In the first step, you'll import the blueprints for the project. Measure can handle any standard image format along with CAD DWF and DWG files. If you know the blueprint scale, you can enter it directly or measure a known length on the drawing and let Measure extrapolate the scale from there. On occasion, you may receive a blueprint that isn't quite suitable for a takeoff. Perhaps it's a copy of a copy of a copy that's no longer to scale within itself, or maybe it's just a little askew. In any case, you have several tools that allow you to prepare the blueprint so that it can be traced accurately. Step 2 involves setting up the underlying data for the project. So you'll go to the Project Information screen, and you can enter customer data by hand or import it from RFMS. Entering customer data and job information up front will help keep your printed plans and reports organized by including this data in the header or footer. The other bit of support data we need are the specs for the products to be used in the project. Similarly to the project information screen, product data can also be entered by hand or imported from RFMS. Of course, you don't want to do all this data entry for every project so commonly used items can be saved as defaults, which means they'll automatically be available in each new project. Once you've set up your product list and project information, it's time for step three, tracing over the blueprint and allocating material. We have a whole host of drawing tools to help you lay out the various room shapes on the drawing. Among other things, you can calculate material for stairways, indicate the location of doorways so perimeter products are automatically deducted, and of course, factor in auxiliary items such as carpet pad, labor charges, and so on. If roll products are in use, Measure will provide a preliminary seam and cut plan, but will also give you all the necessary tools to adjust that default plan as you see fit. The idea is that every aspect of your takeoff can be estimated with a high degree of accuracy right here in a single piece of software. Once the rooms are drawn and they've had material assigned to them, then you'll move to step four reviewing the worksheet. The worksheet is a central location where all of the quantity and pricing information from the entire job is compiled. In its default configuration, each line will represent a single product or service. It shows you the net area for each product, a calculated waste factor based on actual usage, and of course gross quantities and total costs. Although this is mostly a report screen, there are a few things that can be tweaked here. For instance, you can enter a margin for each line or open the Margin Explorer to see how different margins will affect the bottom line. The last step in a measure takeoff involves putting this compiled data to work. One option you have is to export the job to RFMS as a quote or order. If you don't currently use RFMS, but you'd like to manipulate the data further, you can export the worksheet to Excel. There are also many plans and reports that can be printed or exported to a PDF. For example, the seam plan shows precisely how roll products should be laid out. Pair it with the cut plan, and your installers will have everything they need to get the job done to your specifications. There's obviously a lot more to measure that we simply don't have time to show today, but that should at least give you a basic idea of the workflow. So having covered that, let's move on to what's next for measure. We've put in a lot of work over the past year to essentially overhaul measure in some big ways. Now, in hearing that, I'm sure any existing Measure users may cringe a little. After all, you have a tool that you're used to. You like the way it works now. You know where all the buttons and levers are. You don't want to have to relearn things. Well, this was one of the design challenges we faced with this project. On the one hand, we want to provide a more modern experience, a new look, new tools, new features, and so on. But on the other hand, we certainly didn't want to frustrate or alienate our existing users by shaking things up too much. I think when you see what we've done, you'll find that we've kept a pretty nice balance between improving what was there before without changing it too drastically. Our goal is for existing users to be able to hit the ground running when this update releases next month.
Before we dig into the software itself, I'd like to briefly discuss one really important under the hood change we've made. Until now, we've produced Measure as a 32 bit app. What is that? Well, we don't want to get too far into the weeds, but basically it means the software could only take limited advantage of the resources available to a modern PC. So if you have 16 or even 32 gigs of RAM, a 32-bit app would only be able to address a fraction of that. For the user experience, that translated to less responsive software and even instability in larger projects. Well, part of our update work has been converting the software over to a 64-bit framework. What that means is that now Measure can take full advantage of the system resources common to modern PCs. On workstations that meet our recommended specs, we found that navigating around even the largest commercial projects is now smooth and responsive. Additionally, our beta testers and in-house estimators have reported that the software is much more stable. We're excited about this major change and we're looking forward to getting the new and improved measure into your hands. Now let's go in and take a look at what's new. First off, you'll probably notice some cosmetic changes. We've added a little splash of color here and there, updated fonts, and generally tried to make the application look a bit more modern. An important part of that modernization can be seen in this area along the left side of the screen. This is Measure's new navigation bar. It allows users to quickly access a number of important screens, and from top to bottom provides a basic workflow for a commercial bid. So starting a new takeoff, you'll probably want to begin at the top and import the digital blueprints for the job. Once that's done, You'll enter customer and job details, or import these from your RFMS database. Next, you'll set up your product list. As you draw in various elements, you may decide to view some in 3D. This icon opens the 3D viewer. Finally, you'll want to access the worksheet as we discussed earlier. Directly to the right of the navigation bar is another new UI element. This is what we're calling the palette bar. In its default format, it provides a way to quickly assign products to rooms. So I could grab this ceramic tile product, drag it into this room, and it's immediately assigned there. This also works for multi-room assignments. I could select all of these rooms, drag product over one of them, and it's then assigned to all of them because they were all selected. This drag and drop functionality works not only for main products like carpet or tile, but also add-on items. Let's say these rooms need several add-ons from the miscellaneous product category. I can control click each item, drag them over, and they're immediately assigned to the rooms and calculated. Now it's not only products that can be assigned in this manner. You can also place patterns from your QuickTile library and stacks from your local machine or your company's stacks library. One final sidebar feature I'd like to show you is found in this panel on the right side of the screen. This interface element has always been here, but we've added an important new feature to it. This is the Summary View. It presents you with a sort of lightweight worksheet. It has a single line for each item in use on the project, and for each line it lists style and color name, gross quantity, and subtotal, with a grand total at the bottom. Significantly, all of this is dynamic. It updates in real time as changes are made to the project. At this point, you may be saying to yourself, oh no, I don't like this. The drawing area is so much smaller. Well, don't worry, I have good news. All of the areas we've just talked about can be moved around or even hidden. If I don't want to see the palette all the time, I can simply unpin it and it slides out of view. If or when I want to access it, I simply move my cursor over the tab on the left side of the screen and it slides back into view. The palette, the navigation bar, and even the sidebar on the right all have this same functionality. In fact, if you unpin all of them, you end up with more viewable canvas than you've ever had before. In addition to unpinning, any of these new sidebar elements can be torn away, resized, and floated elsewhere on the screen. And finally, they can be docked to whichever side of the screen you prefer. Ultimately, this means that you can set up your tools in a configuration that makes the most sense to you. Once you've established a layout you like, you don't have to worry about losing it because the size and position of each UI element is sticky, meaning that Measure remembers exactly how you left it, and each time you start a new Measure session, you're presented with your preferred custom layout.
There is one final aspect of the user interface I'd like to go over. In the current version of Measure, most drawing tools are split between two tabs on the ribbon bar. You have some on the Home tab, and then certain other tools under the Room tab. It can become confusing sometimes trying to remember which tab contains the tool you want to use. So I want to draw a transition. Is that the Home or Room tab? And then you have to go hunting. As we were moving various items from the ribbon bar to the nav bar, we realized we picked up a lot of extra space on the Home tab, and it no longer made sense to have all of these frequently used tools spread out across two tabs. So most tools from the Room tab have now been consolidated onto the Home tab, which means no more hunting. Every tool you might need to draw or edit rooms is immediately accessible. More specialized tools, or those that are not frequently used, have been distributed out to various other tabs that can be accessed as you need them. For instance, 3D tools are now placed on their own 3D tab. Consolidating frequently used tools onto a single tab might seem like a small change, and technically it is. But over the course of a large project, this eliminates a lot of extra mouse clicks, and that means more time to get out more bids. Now that we've covered some of the more obvious UI changes, let's briefly take a step back and consider another new feature that may not stand out visually, but marks a major change in how commercial users can operate the software. Measure has always used the concept of modes. As an example, when you open the product list, you've entered a separate mode. You can't do anything else in Measure until you wrap up your business with the product list and close it out. The same situation exists with the worksheet, with custom forms, and with the layout screen where you're specifying seam locations. When these features are in use, the software is locked into a mode that you must back out of before you can resume drawing or access any other mode. Well, we're pleased to announce that Measure is now modeless. Let's see what that means in practical terms. I'm going to open up a demo project and then navigate to the product list. Now, say this beige carpet needs to be updated with some new parameters. I'm going to assign it a new color, change its roll width from 12 to 10 feet, and, oh yeah, it actually has a pattern. We'll plug that information in, and when I click Apply, the changes are immediately visible. We now have a pattern match, the default seam layout change to reflect a narrower roll width, and the color updated. Additionally, if I don't mind the extra space it takes up, I can keep the product list open throughout a whole project and use it to drag and drop products into the job in the same manner as we demonstrated earlier with the palette bar. Now let's get in a little deeper with the whole modeless concept. I'm going to navigate to the worksheet and put it alongside the product list. Now I'm going to update the price of Carpet Solid A. As soon as I click Apply, the change is pushed out through the software and it appears immediately in the worksheet with an updated unit cost, subtotal, and grand total. So ditching the concept of modes allows data to flow more freely through the software and update in real time. For this demo, obviously screen space is a priority. If I was estimating using this single monitor setup, I probably would not elect to have the product list and worksheet open at all times. But for those of you who have a more expansive setup, we envision some users choosing to work in a configuration sort of like this. We have the product list on one monitor, the drawing canvas in the middle with both main sidebars hidden to maximize drawing space, and the full worksheet open on the right. Every detail and data point about this project is now at my fingertips, updating dynamically as I put together my bid. That is what modeless measure brings to the table. Having said all of that, as we were doing this work, we polled a segment of our commercial users about what kind of setup they run. We fully expected most estimators to have at least a couple of monitors hooked up to their workstation, but a surprising majority responded saying they just have one monitor. In fact, quite a few were doing large commercial bids on a laptop of all things. So that brings us back full circle to one of the UI enhancements discussed earlier we wanted to figure out how to provide a fuller modeless experience for users who run Measure on a single monitor. That actually was the inspiration for the new palette bar and the summary view. They each serve respectively as a lightweight product list and a lightweight worksheet. Obviously, if you have multiple monitors and can therefore afford the space of having everything open at once, you're going to have more controls available to you. But we did make sure that our single monitor users also benefited from the work we did on going modeless. 
The next feature I'd like to show you has to do with product allocation. In previous versions of Measure, working with seams took place in a separate layout mode. So after you drew in some rooms containing carpet or vinyl, you'd click the layout button, and a progress bar would appear as Measure began calculating an initial seam layout then allocating cuts onto rolls. Once it finished, you could begin working with your seam and cut layout. With the performance gains achieved by moving to 64-bit, you no longer have to wait for allocation to take place. That process now occurs in the background, which eliminates the progress bar and allows you to keep working while Measure does its calculations. Since there's no more layout mode, we created this new tab to house seam-specific tools. Notice that while I'm on the Home tab, I'm able to select entire rooms, move them, change their shape, etc. But when I go to the Seams tab, a couple of things happen. First, the right sidebar automatically flips over to the Estimate view, so I can see product usage details. Secondly, even though we aren't technically in a separate mode, having the Seams tab open does change how you interact with the drawing. Now, when I click on a room, if it contains a roll product, I'm actually selecting the specific cut that was under my cursor. I can also select seams and move them as I see fit. Again, this behavior is specific to the seams tab. When any other tab is active, the cursor goes back to its default behavior, and the sidebar on the right goes back to listing room names. Up to this point, our discussion has primarily focused on some of the more sweeping, high-level changes that have been made to measure. Let's now review some new tools and enhancements to existing features. As you know, in the world of commercial estimating, a regular part of the job involves importing digital blueprints and preparing them for tracing. Here's what you see today when you import a blueprint into Measure. There's a lot of technical jargon going on that really has nothing to do with your work as an estimator. We've got DPI, required memory, and what even is a rasterized image, right? But because some blueprints are so large and limited system resources were a factor, you actually did need to understand some of this to manage the size of your project files and ensure you don't overload your system. Well, our new import graphics process eliminates that completely. Let's take a look. When a PDF is loaded, you first select which pages to import. This process of selecting pages is basically the same as what you have in the current public version, but there is an important difference. In 32-bit measure, you select the pages you want to import, and then only after they're actually imported can you go back and scale them, crop them, or perform any other work to get them ready for the takeoff. A potential problem with that workflow is that users can easily forget to go back after the import and prepare each page. The new import process helps with that problem by allowing you to prepare each page before importing. Clicking the checkbox next to a page indicates that you want it to be included in the import. Clicking on the page itself shows you a preview of it and allows you to configure it. Let's say this first page is 1 8 scale and the second is 1 quarter. I can adjust them independently of one another. Of course, if I want to import them both, then I need to make sure they're both checked. When a page is selected, you also have the option to zoom in and out and pan around the preview to get a better view. If the scale isn't shown on the plan, click this button to perform a manual scale based off of a known length in the image. The performance enhancements that have gone into this version of Measure mean that you no longer need to be overly concerned with things like DPI and memory usage, so we no longer show them. If your computer meets the recommended specs for Measure, it should be able to handle whatever you throw at it. Finally, notice the row of buttons along the bottom of the import window. Things like rotating, cropping, and straightening now take place as part of the import process and can be performed on each page before it's loaded into the canvas. If you overlook something, like maybe you forgot to scale or rotate a particular page, then you still have the Blueprint tab on the ribbon bar that allows you to make those adjustments after a page has been brought in. One thing I've always liked about Measure is that it gives you a big toolbox with plenty of options to develop your own methods of drawing. For instance, say we've got a large room with a notch taken out of the center of the north wall for a fireplace. One estimator might grab the right angle tool and simply plot the room out one wall at a time. Another might start out drawing it as a large square, then add a couple of points on the north wall, 
and drag the center down. The point is that there are generally several tools that can be used to tackle the same problem, and it's up to you to choose which ones you prefer. Well, we'd like to shine a spotlight on a new option, specifically geared for commercial takeoffs. An early iteration of the Takeoff Assist tool was added to measure in the August 2020 release, but it's seen a lot of improvements and iteration over the course of the past year, rendering it usable in a wider variety of situations. To highlight how handy this new tool can be, Let's start out by considering how an estimator might tackle a challenging room shape with Measure's standard drawing tools. How would you trace this CPT-12 area? Well, in older versions of Measure, you'd have a couple of options. One would be to draw a series of very short line segments around the perimeter to roughly outline the shape. This, however, is not very precise, and frankly, it takes a lot of time and effort especially in a project containing many similarly shaped rooms. If I wanted to get fancy, I could grab the Polygon tool and use it in conjunction with Measure's 5-point curve. So I would draw a line across one section, then activate the 5-point curve, and begin placing my points, repeating this process until the entire shape is traced. This method might save a little time, but it still isn't offering the level of precision we want to achieve. Well, this is actually a perfect scenario for Takeoff Assist. I'll switch back to 64-bit measure, and let's see how it works. When I activate the tool, there's a brief pause as it analyzes the blueprint. It's quickly determining where it detects boundaries and where there are empty spaces that may represent rooms or parts of rooms. Now the Takeoff Assist window appears. At the top, it lists two possible actions I can take. Then below that, it has some controls that basically let me dial it in to the particulars of the blueprint I'm tracing. That first option is important. Basically, what it means is that as I'm painting in the white space on the drawing, if I miss some small area, like this little triangle for instance, it will ignore it rather than cutting a 3-inch hole in the room it creates. A couple of other options worth noting. We can choose to automatically detect transitions, in other words, doorways, and we can tell Measure to flag them as such. Then we can dial in the maximum width for any doorways it may find. So essentially we're telling it, if you think you've detected a doorway, but it's wider than 3 foot 6, you're wrong. It's not an actual doorway. Ignore it. The default settings work fine for this blueprint, so I'm going to begin at the top, click and hold the left mouse button, and paint in each segment of this shape. When I get to the bottom, I'll click this button or press Enter, and the room is drawn. As I mentioned earlier, Measure provides many tools that allow you to tackle projects in different ways, but no one tool is going to be ideal in every circumstance. So on blueprints with a lot of visual noise, that is to say architectural symbols, text, measurements, and so on, Takeoff Assist probably isn't going to be your go-to solution. Nevertheless, there will be many instances where it can save you a lot of time and enhance the accuracy of your takeoffs. So we encourage you, when you get the update, to test it out, and of course, as time goes on, we'll continue iterating on it and improving it. While we're here, take a look at the outline of the area we just created. If I zoom in close, you can see clearly that it's rendered using a lot of very small straight line segments. Because these lines are so short, they're a fairly accurate representation of the curves. There wouldn't technically be an issue leaving it as is. But what if you wanted the shape to appear a bit cleaner and be made up of actual curves? We can do that with the new Fit Curve tool. This tool allows you to highlight any number of line segments and convert them over to an actual curve. Doing that will eliminate the multitude of points and handles and allow you to adjust the shape using Measure's actual curve interface. Here's how it works. With the room selected, I'll activate the Fit Curve tool. A red dot appears on the perimeter of the room. This represents the start point of a curve. I'll go ahead and start it here, and as I drag the cursor over, a red line appears along with another dot representing the end point of the curve. There's also a tool tip listing a measurement. This measurement represents the deviation from the original shape. Since we're converting a series of straight lines into a curve, they don't always translate perfectly. For instance, if I tried to go all out and highlight a very long section, we can see that there's quite a bit of deviation. 
The point here is that you determine how much deviation is acceptable and draw in a series of curves that match your tolerance. So maybe you're okay with up to a half inch of deviation in order to smooth out this shape. You would draw out a segment until it hits that half inch deviation point and click to convert it to a curve. Now just repeat that process until the entire shape has been converted. The result is a cleaner outline and clear measurements that mark the distance between the start and end point of each curve. There's one more point I want to cover while we're talking about curves. In the current version of Measure, complex curves are represented by a series of five adjustable points. This has always been usable, but not ideal. In discussing this feature with one of our programmers, he brought out that the industry standard for modeling smooth curves in a graphical application like Measure is known as a Bezier curve. So we set about adopting this model into Measure. It sounds complex, but it's actually very simple to use. Advanced curves are now defined using just these two points. As you drag them, you can see how far the curve juts out or in, and the exact angle for each end of the curve. This replaces the five-point curve with a simpler model that allows for the same or greater complexity than we've ever had before. Now I'd like to show you a new tool that enables you to do something Measure has never supported before. Up to this point, the only way to have more than one main flooring material in a single room was in the case of borders. So you could have one color carpet in the center of a room and then create a border of some other material, but that was it. What if you have a wide open area that has several different colors of, let's say, vinyl insets? Well, they would all have to be drawn as separate rooms. This could open you up to some potential problems if you weren't paying attention. Take this as an example. It's actually one large room with one color vinyl on one side and another color on the other. But we had to draw it as two rooms. Let's say we need to apply Cove Base. Of course, it would have to be applied to both rooms. Now do you see the problem? If I'm not careful to go into both areas and remove the Cove Base from between them, I'm going to end up with an overage. Our new Material Area feature solves this problem and allows you to draw much neater plans. Let's take the same scenario over to measure 64-bit. Currently, the two areas are drawn as two rooms, but because they're adjoining, I can select them both and click a new button called Join Material Areas. First and most importantly, they're now a single room. When I click on it using the Select tool, both areas are included in the selection. The Explorer window lists it as the only room on the project, and if I move it, both areas move together. It's literally now just one room. What about the cove base problem we looked at earlier? Let's try it again. I'll select the entire room, open the add-on dialog, and select cove base. Because the entire room was selected, it accurately applied the material just around the outside, but not on the line where the two areas meet. What about assigning add-ons to individual material areas? Well, that's fully supported. I'll select the area on the left and assign one type of adhesive, then select the other area and assign a different adhesive. Selecting the room as a whole correctly shows that the only add-on assigned to the entire room is the cove base. When I drill down to an individual area, however, there I can see that each one has its own distinct adhesive. Each material area is named automatically but this can be changed by double-clicking on the name of an area. And finally, you can distinguish where add-ons are being applied by the location of the add-on icon. Seeing it directly next to a material area name tells me that this area has its own add-on. If the icon is in its normal spot in the upper left corner of the room, then I know that there is at least one add-on applied at the room level. You'll recall that I created these two material areas by selecting two rooms and joining them using that new button. But that's not actually the only way to do it. It's also possible to take an existing room and divide it up into as many material areas as needed using this tool. I'm going to activate it and draw several lines that basically divide the room vertically. Unlike room drawing tools, you don't have to come back to your start point to close off the shape. I can just press Enter, and the room is split into two material areas. What if I have an inlay, for instance? 
Simply draw it as a closed shape within another material area and press Enter. The last thing I'd like to mention about material areas is that you can create more than one at the same time. Let's divide up another big room, this time in a single operation. I'll start out dividing off this left portion. Now I want to create an inlay, so I'll press the Tab key to lift the pen from the page, so to speak, and draw a square. I'll press Tab one more time, and let's divide off the right side of the room as well. Once I'm all finished, I'll press Enter, and four distinct material areas are created. We've been able to look at a few of the larger features coming to measure, but with the limited time we have left, I'd like to demonstrate a few quality of life items that should enhance the overall user experience. First, we've improved navigation between sheets. Best practice in a large project is to import one blueprint per sheet, but this can present a problem when many sheets are in use. To find the one you're looking for, you have to scroll back or forward with these two buttons at the bottom, which can be a bit cumbersome on large commercial jobs. To address this, the sheet list has been enhanced. You can now double-click a sheet or select it and click OK to navigate to it. Sheets can also be reordered by selecting one or more and clicking the up or down arrow or dragging them. Another helpful new feature is the Fill Room tool. Say you have a large building with many offices connected by corridors. This tool allows you to draw the offices first and then automatically fill in the spaces between. So in this example, I have 16 individual offices. I can select the Fill Room tool click on the white space between them, and the corridors are filled in automatically as a single new room. What about on the reporting side of things? Well, we have an interesting update to the cut plan. By default, the cut plan gives you a diagram for each roll product on the project. It shows the length of each cut group and the dimensions for each cut. You can also optionally display text instructions as well. These written instructions can be somewhat helpful in certain situations, but they've never provided quite enough information to be especially useful. Well, this has been enhanced so that it can now be displayed more intuitively as a table containing more information. You get a heading for each cut group, and then each cut within the group is displayed on a line in the table. It tells you which room the cut goes into, the overall length of the cut, and finally, if the room has any special instructions attached to it as a note, those are shown here for your installers to reference. Another enhancement is related to Measure's hole cutting tools. We've always trained that when you're cutting material around the outside of a room, you want to go ahead and extend the hole selection box fully outside the perimeter. The reason for doing it this way is to avoid situations where you just come right to the edge of the room but don't quite get all the material leaving a tiny sliver that, if allowed to remain, is just going to create additional waste. But what about situations where the room you're cutting a hole in adjoins another room? Well, that's not a problem because you had to select the room before you could activate the hole tool, so the software knows to only cut material out of the selected room. What if you wanted to cut material out of multiple rooms simultaneously? Well, that's never been possible because Measure's hole cutting tools required one, and only one room be selected before they can be used. We've done some work to improve that logic, and now you can cut material out of multiple rooms at the same time. Just select each room from which you want to remove material and begin drawing. One thing you may have noticed throughout this presentation is the constant presence of seams. In 32-bit measure, seams were only visible while layout mode was active. But because measure is now modeless and seams are calculated behind the scenes as you perform the takeoff, we can show them at all times. Hopefully you'll find that helpful, but no doubt there will be estimators who don't want seams cluttering up their drawing while they're simply trying to trace rooms. For those estimators, we have an option to control seam visibility. Although they're always visible by default, you can flip this toggle in the Options screen and they'll only show up while the Seams tab is active. While we're in the Options screen, I'd like to show you one final new feature. Under the Drawing section, we have a new checkbox labeled Snap Cursor to Handles. Since this is new behavior, we have it turned off by default, but you can go here to enable it. Just as its name implies, 
It causes the mouse cursor to snap onto a nearby point or handle once it's within a few pixels of it. The idea behind this is that, particularly when working with large projects on high-resolution monitors, it can be difficult to place the cursor precisely on the point you're trying to select. This is another technically small quality-of-life feature that shows its value over the course of a large project. It may only cost a couple of seconds extra when you're trying to target your cursor onto a small handle, but how many times does that happen over the course of each project? Again, it's a relatively small feature, but it will hopefully make your life as an estimator a little easier. That about does it for the time we have allotted for this presentation. Obviously, there are a lot more good things in store for Measure that we just weren't able to show today, but these will be fully documented in the release notes that go out with the next update. For those of you who are current Measure users, of course we want to thank you for your business and also let you know that our beta testing program is open for any who would like to participate. That'll not only allow you to try out new features before they go public, but also enable you to help shape the future of Measure by offering your direct feedback to our development team. If you'd like to join the Measure beta test program, just contact our support department and they'll be happy to get you set up. Since we do have a few minutes left, we'd like to open the discussion up to the audience. Do you have any questions about what we've shown today, or is there anything you'd like to revisit?